All right, everyone relax. Me and Captain K are back. We're here to teach you about malware, exploits, and cyber ops, simply because who else better to teach you about this than to strapping cyber operators? Because this is where cyber ops gets fun. We get to learn about how to break things, and we're going to tell you all about how that happens. All right, so let's just get into it. So like always, these are the objectives of the lesson. Just make sure you're paying attention to these objectives. Make sure you're taking notes on these objectives. Clearly, this is what you're supposed to be learning from this lesson. So first and foremost, we're going to define the types of malware and their role in the cyber attack methodology. We're going to summarize some common types of vulnerabilities and how they're exploited. And we're going to define Internet of Things. The computer networks exist all around us, and they are infiltrating our lives. Uh, kind of funny but your average car might have 30 or 40 computer systems on, on board uh, your uh, when you use the plumbing uh, or the electrical grid that has hundreds of thousands of devices across the United States that make that happen and we're going to talk about how some people might want to break these and how we can protect them we're going to summarize the vulnerabilities inherent to ICS uh, mostly because those are the things that we keep us up at night. ICS is the scary part. When you start talking about computers that control your fresh water supply or your nuclear power plant that's in your city or wastewater and things of that nature, or power plants in general, this is where things get very scary and this is where the cyber world starts to touch on the physical world in a very bad way. And last, we're going to go over some offensive cyber operations and how they can achieve effects in support of operations in the physical and cyberspace domains. So with that being said, let's just get started. So like always, we've been showing you the phases of cyber attack. Realize we are now in the fun stuff. We're going to be talking about gaining, maintaining, and covering our tracks. The true, when you think of hacking, what hacking truly is, and we're going to be talking about those things. Right there. So we're going to talk about how to gain access, meaning to exploit or implement, uh, infiltrate the target. We're going to escalate privileges, which is like the holy grail of hacking, the hard part if you ask me. We're also going to do some backup access, because what's the point of hacking if we can't get back into it easily? You don't want to hack it twice. And last but not least, covering your tracks. And this is where things get very interesting in the military sense of the idea is because when we think of hackers, we think of hackers taking down systems and breaking things. But a lot of times, hackers are just trying to gain intel. They're trying to steal secrets. And this recovering tracks comes in. If you never know that they were there, then you're not going to cover up those holes that they exploited to get in in the first place. So with that, let's see what's going next. You want to go over the common type of vulnerabilities? Absolutely. So we've talked about vulnerabilities before with the CIA triad. And so these are just some of the common ways that we might attack certain types of vulnerabilities. So we place trust in the people around us, and that trust can be exploited through social engineering, phishing. Uh, your computers exist as a piece of software, and those pieces of software might have bugs or errors, uh, and those errors might allow a person to attack or gain uh, the ability to execute code within those uh, systems. Servers or services have limited amount of capability that they can pr provide. So if we can stop you from knowing about a service, if we can overload that service, then we can stop people from being able to use it. Databases are all about their, their ability to handle uh, incoming data and information. And if they don't handle it in the proper way, it might allow somebody to execute code in a way that we don't want. And same with websites, they're all about sharing information. So if I write something to a web server and then somebody else looks at it, if the server isn't handling that correctly, I might be able to gain some information about you uh, that I might uh, want that you might not want me to have. But because the website is handling that data poorly, it might allow that information to be passed to me. Um, first and foremost, let's talk about malware, uh, which is simply just uh, short for malicious software. It's going to be any software program designed to cause an undesirable effect on a computing system executed. Uh, one of the famous phrases back in the day was software can do at least two things. One is what it was designed to do, and one was what it was not designed to do. And that holds true even today in 2020. Uh, think about your Python programs. It's a great example up there is you were not coding thinking about security whatsoever. And most of those programs that took input or did things were probably very easily exploited. Um, some things are just annoying. Uh, some of the, There was a new malware that just came out last year that someone did where it just hijacked your mouse. 
and started clicking random things. It was an attack on gamers. So when gamers were playing their favorite game on Twitch, their mouse would be taken over and they would just stare at the sun while getting shot at. Uh, other times, it can be very bad. And we're talking about the ones that take your personal information or encrypt everything like WannaCry was a great example. You don't think there's anything on your computer that really matters until you no longer have your computer and you'll never have access to that information. A lot of people lost valuable information, not just sentimental, but bank accounts and things of that nature. Uh, we can talk about the two different ways to detect malware. Uh, we break it down to signature-based and behavior-based. Realize most of the time we are going to be doing a little bit of both and we're going to do multiple layers. But signature-based is very simple. It's looking for that exact file. It's looking for something that virus does all the way down to just the virus name. Um, behavior-based is uh, considered to be the holy grail of detection, but it's a lot harder. Now we're looking at what does that virus do and how can I detect it without actually seeing it? The, the best example I can think of this is if your house got robbed, if your security system only looked for robbers and if only saw a robber and alerted people, then that would be a very easy system to bypass. Well, and we can also think about some of the behavior-based items as uh, resources and who can access those resources. So we might say only I can access this uh, part of my house and anybody trying to access this part of my house in a way that uh, isn't normal. So if they tried to say drill through the outside of my house, I might want to stop that. So that's a very simple example, but we can apply these to software as well. So certain permissions accessing certain resources at, at specific times. Well, that's, that's actually a really good example, simply because behavior-based can be compared to the sensor to see if your window got open or not. Mm -hmm. And that's where behavior-based kind of goes downhill quickly is sometimes you get a lot of what we call false positives. So when you open your window to air out your house and you forgot to turn off your alarm, now the police just got called because there's a burglar in your house because your window got open. And that is not that is not how any of this works. So just remember that signature-based is looking for the actual file. Behavior-based is looking for the things that that file will do. And it gets very difficult in a computer to detect them either way. Here's the categories of malware. You want to go over these ones? Absolutely. Let's do it. So the categories of malware can be kind of tricky to define because many pieces of malware hide their abilities or they will combine multiple pieces of these into uh, one piece of software or one piece of code. So when we talk about a virus, that virus cannot exist on its own. It doesn't have the ability to execute. So just like an actual virus, uh, that virus needs a person to live and to continue to do things. So a virus attacks on or attaches onto something else that's executing and it subverts its normal um, processes and, and things that it's able to do in order to carry out its own objective. A worm, when we think about a worm, we can actually look at a worm. A worm can move, a worm can do things on its own. And so this is similar to a virus in that it's trying to do something with these uh, systems that it's interacting with that it's not supposed to. But this piece of software can continue to move and to propagate and to uh, go to other places on its own. So a Trojan horse is again a kind of virus or it could be a worm, but it's some designed to look like something innocuous. And then when you click on it, say, let's say you're trying to download a a chat client that uh, your friend told you about and you try and install it and surprise it actually installs two things on your, your computer rather than just one. And that hidden in is really interesting as well because on the open source side of the world if you look up CCleaner, CCleaner was actually one of the most downloaded programs in like 2018, 2019, even now in 2020 it's still being used which is amazing to me. And hackers broke into CCleaner servers and attached a Trojan horse to that file and reposted it and just disappeared and covered their tracks as we talked about before. And then millions of users downloaded a legitimate program from a legitimate site that was a Trojan horse that had vir uh, malware hidden inside of it. And it was a very probably one of the most successful t t uh, attacks I've seen in a long time. So rootkits are kind of a generic term for anything that is able to hide malicious activity. So these can exist uh, with root level privileges. These can exist in your firmware. These can exist uh, anywhere in the privilege stack of your computer. And the higher, or I should say lower they go, the more they might be able to hide from you. 
So your computer relies on the um, BIOS and the actual um, firmware of your computer to tell it what's going on. So if a rootkit was able to subvert that ability for you to see, say, what processes are going on, it might be able to run a process without you knowing about it. A logic bomb is just a piece of code that's designed to execute at a specific time or when a specific action is taking place. Um, I'm not gonna go into too many uh, details, but we might talk about this more when we talk about some of how these get applied. A backdoor is simply another way to access a system. So we might think of our normal like logon methods as a front door. A backdoor is anything that allows me access that bypasses those mechanisms of authentication or um, logging in. A keystroke logger is something that allows me to type or collect the keystrokes of somebody on that computer. And think about your um, banking websites or your logons to uh, a computer. Um, if all of that was encrypted, so especially let's think about like a banking system. Everything is encrypted from one end to the other. But if I have the ability to log your keystrokes, then I can gather that information without you knowing about it. And lastly, spyware is just any piece of code that gives me information about you or about a person uh, that they might not want. So it's something that is installed or that it exists for a short period of time. And its sole purpose is to get information back to the uh, person who is running that code. I realize we use this kind of information to help categorize certain pieces of malware and things of that nature, but it's still a very old school way of looking at things. Nowadays, if anything is successful, it's going to have one, if not every one of these parts built into it. Uh, it's very, very seldom you see an attack that is only a virus or only a Trojan horse. Nowadays, it's going to contain a little bit of everything and it's going to come at the systems hard and fast and it's going to wreck it's going to wreck house. What is this? So Is that a Venn diagram? It is a Venn diagram. Ooh -hoo. So when we think about the cyber attack methodology, we want to think about the different phases. And we want to think about how these might fit into the different phases. So a backdoor is particularly applicable to the maintain access. Because we want to be able to log into those systems again and again and again. The rootkit uh, kind of fits into both categories of maintain and cover because it might allow us that backdoor, but it also might be able to cover the presence of certain items on that computer. Um, I won't go into too many of the other ones, but all of these kind of showcase where they fit into the overall attack phase methodology. I realize keystroke logger is in the middle for a reason. It's, it's very interesting simply because that was probably one of the first ever viruses back in the day used keystroke logger. And today it's still probably one of the most powerful pieces of any malware. Because if I know what the user is typing and nothing can stop me from seeing what you can type, I can come up with what you're doing. I can come up with the secrets that you're typing, your passwords, even figure out your day-to-day -day operations so I can figure out how to get around it. So even though a keystroke logger is probably one of the oldest pieces of malware, it is still today the cornerstone of a lot of malware. Zero day vulnerabilities. Mind if I take this one? Go for I it. love zero days. <laughs> so zero days, zero days. All it really means is no one knows about it yet. And you're probably going to think, well, how can that be dangerous? What it means is the companies or the people that are running the targets or software don't know about it yet. So they're known only to those who identify. So think of your programmer or hacker that finds the moment he finds out oh, i could probably exploit this this is vulnerable the moment he knows that that is a zero day and these are very very dangerous uh you can see in the second line damage is done before the victim realizes they're vulnerable so this is a great thing once vulnerability becomes public a solution to fix problem must be developed and implemented so there's another great example so we talked about day one so even if we openly admit to this vulnerability until there's a fix it's still a vulnerability and these are the big money. These are the ones that on the black market and nation states are selling for the big money. These are the ones that they hold very close because we don't want to use them. When you use a zero day, it's called burning because now once you use it, if you get caught, everyone's going to know about it and they're going to patch. So we're very close to heart. And that final line is 
Uh, I put that in there. These are the scary ones because there's nothing to do to prepare for them. And that's not completely true. You can always have a good security system. But if you don't know about a vulnerability and no one knows about that vulnerability except for the bad guy, it can be a very bad day because no matter how expensive your security system is or how well-trained your operators are, uh, a well-placed zero day can actually wreak some massive havoc in the world. And all sides of the coin have done this before, and there's a lot of open source information out there that we have to be careful when we discuss because there's also classified information. But zero days are usually the crutch to many of these big, big exploits that hit the news. And so. this is what we talked about earlier with behavior base being the holy grail oh. of detecting because there's sometimes where you could detect bad behavior in a zero day mm -hmm. that you could stop without even knowing that that vulnerability exists. It's very, it's a very challenging, but it's very challenging. And there's huge bounties for zero days as well. If you go out there as you progress in your software engineering track or whatever track you just pick, uh, finding zero days is huge money and a big deal. And a lot of them are actually found by colleges. Yeah. So during research, denial of sort the dos attack this is all you captain k so denial just means i prevent you from using it so a lot of people want to think of the software solution but there's really any number of solutions that we could do if we want to deny somebody's ability to use a service so the classic one is what's called a d distributed denial of service and this is where we flood uh requests to a web server in a way that uh, the server is unable to respond to any more requests. So if we can overload a service, then nobody else can use it. And so that's the classic example. But again, there's any number of ways we could do this. We could remove the power. We could encrypt the hard drives of the servers uh, so they couldn't access their information. Uh, anything that prevents somebody from using this service is a denial of service. Mm -hmm. Ooh, SQL injection. This is kind of a hard one to describe if you're not super familiar with SQL, but I'll bring up some information now. But just realize what we really mean is SQL is a very common database language. Uh, you will, If you go down any comm side track, you will most likely learn some of it. But it's also vulnerable if you program it incorrectly. So remember, this is dealing with a database, and databases are what makes the world turn. Your bank account is a database. All your information in any of those websites is in a database. So if I can break that database, then that makes me a very powerful person. And SQL injection is one of those things that's been around for since the beginning of SQL and it's probably not going anywhere, is if you don't code your database right, I can start adding commands. And I think that's what this is going to show here. There we go. So this is a great example. Simply just logging on is actually accessing a database and it's saying, hey, give me your username and give me your password. And one of the problems with this, and if you remember this back from some of your coding, we use a lot of things like we use for strings, we use uh, quotation marks and single quotes and double quotes. So what happens right here, you can see that our uh, illustrious course director has the worst password in history. It's probably accurate. So Major DeFritis decides he's going to log into this email and he's going to use the password 1234. Everyone's happy. But then me or Captain uh K walk back and we say, man, I wonder what happens if we start putting some code in here. And as you can see at the bottom line, it makes perfect sense. When the user email equals Adrian and the password is one, two, three, four, give them some access. But what we can do then is take these and drop them in there. And now let's look what this code does. Even if you don't understand SQL, you should understand drop all tables because that just simply means delete the database. So if you don't prevent me from putting code into this email address, I'm going to say, who cares what my name is? After my name, I'm going to use a single quote, a little semicolon, and say, hey, while you're at it, could you do me a quick favor and uh, delete the entire database? Password, I don't even care at this point. And that's a very, very common attack on SQL. So, ooh, cross-site scripting. This is yours, buddy. So when we think of web services, a lot of them are taking user input, and they are providing it or showcasing it to everybody else who wants to interact with that service. What? There's no websites that do that. <laughs> Reddit, Imgur. Twitter, Twitter, Facebook. I mean, it keeps going. I mean, this, this video could be in the future. There could be something new that we don't even know about. So, so. one of the things that uh, when the website shows up is that there is code that showcases each one of those items. So a cross-site scripting vulnerability is when I'm able to post something and when it shows up on somebody else's computer, it actually runs code that might 
give me information or might log their credit card details as they're trying to log in. And this is all the kind of lumped into how we handle data. And we don't want to execute code or execute instructions that aren't valid or aren't uh, what the program is trying to do. Here's one. Who defending? You can't. It's impossible. <laughs> now, think about back when you were programming in Python or whatever language you were learning prior to this. Um, you never once thought about security or coding for security. But the big thing is, is SQL uh, cross-site scripting can be prevented at the programming level. If you know about these attacks, we can write code to say, hey, don't let them put this into that. Don't read this code. Don't accept simple things like ignore quotes will prevent SQL injection or ignore your open or close brackets or don't let them type it. And it prevents a lot of these attacks. But the problem is, is so many individuals and companies out there are they're pushed so hard to get to the final phase of software development, they forget about that whole you know security thing. So the big thing it comes down to is security starts at the coding of the program. And that's it. We're done already. No, we have some more stuff. What? We're, We're at less than objectives. <laughs> you tricked me, you <laughs> dashing man. That's what uh, we talked about already. This is what we're talking about oh, next. Internet of Things. Worst name ever. I'm just going to say it. Doesn't make any sense. This is but just all the it. things that we connected to the internet mm -hmm. and everything that enables us to do everyday life. So when we talk about our phones, we talk about our cars, we talk about our uh, thermometers to track our heat on our barbecuing. Or our thermometer that tracks our temperature of our aquarium in a casino. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> Google that. You'll see what happened. Um, this was a big change. So in the beginning, we had computers and then we had some cell phones. And, yep. you know, now your microwave can be on the Internet. Your crock pot can be on the Internet. And people don't understand that all of these things become vulnerable. So... Any one single house could easily have a hundred devices online at this point. So usability versus security. I'll take usability, take security. Okay. So IoT usability, there's so many great things that happen with IoT. So you're always online. So I can check my crock pot or my fridge can tell me what I need to buy while I'm at the grocery store. Problem is, is they're on the same internal network and they pass information to each other. And that's great. They trust each other, which as you'll realize quickly, trust is never earned on the internet. And they're designed with simplicity in mind. Your webcam takes a video and sends it to your phone, or your refrigerator takes a picture of its inside contents and sends it to your phone. Not a lot of people are thinking about security of these items. And with that, go ahead and take it, Kevin Kerr. So if we aren't thinking about security, if we're mainly thinking about how we can use this device, we might be able to, say, exploit the ability of this system and what it was supposed to do in order to do something that I want it to do. So it might not have the same level of encryption or password protection that our normal computers use. And that might enable me to run commands or codes or programs that you don't want me to run on that device in order to be able to maneuver or send communications or redirect um, my traffic through the internet in a way that you might not be expecting. And because they're always connected, because they're already enabled with some of the basic tools, they can provide really great access points for people seeking to subvert the security or the um, ways of connecting to devices that you might not think about. Every one of those devices in your house is a gateway to your network. And all I need to do is find one of them. Ooh, ICS, the scary stuff. So it really is. Like I make jokes about it, but ICS is where everyone starts to get a little nervous. If we hack your computer, that sucks. You're going to lose some information. If I hack a medical database, uh, we're going to lose some patient records and Privacy Act information, and that's pretty bad. But when I hack the power plant and I shut off power or, heaven forbid, cause an industrial disaster, that's when things get really, really ugly. And as we slowly transition into the future, more and more of these things are becoming computer controlled and access to the network. Back in the day, it was just power plants, but now even traffic lights are controlled by the internet and things of that nature. So think about that in your day-to-day -day lives as you're driving through, how much stuff is actually controlled. Uh, vulnerabilities, so early ICS, uh, they were all vulnerable. They, all, they were horrible. Um, this is, uh, we'll get into it later, or if we don't, we can do it on the side, but war dialing, 
This is what ore dialing was looking for. It was looking for ICS systems. Um, it used to be you could log into, a, you could call a 56K modem on a power plant and just take her down. Um, I also said, it just assumed that if you had access to the ICS that you were a good person. That was a really bad idea because mm -hmm. now when you get access to ICS, not, not only good people, but bad people get access to it. And finally, they're customized for specific systems such as are difficult or costly to upgrade. And this is the big one. A lot of power plants that are currently running are running on the same ICS system from the 1980s yep. or even later. And this technology has been around for so long that there is very public hacks and easy exploits that can be done. But for that power plant company, it's all about the bottom dollar. And if there's no reason for them to upgrade, uh, you know, a million dollar upgrade, they're not going to do it. And they actually become not only the primary target, but actually an easy target, which is a deadly mixture. So why does the Air Force care? We rely on ICS to uh, electricity to run our day-to-day -day operations. We rely on electricity. We, we, will, we rely on gasoline production. We rely on jet fuel production. We rely on communications, our radar. Everything runs on these uh, systems that require ICS to be the backbone provider for. And so if we don't have those systems, then we can't do our operations. And they're not always our systems either. Think about USOP as a great example. We don't get a, We don't have a power plant on base. We have to get that from off base. So there's systems out there that are vulnerable that we don't even have control over that can affect our day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. So this kind of goes the same thing. Talk about the whole spectrum of systems and how operations work. Think about the most simplest things. If a base loses power for a couple of days, how easy is it going to be for that base to complete its mission? or even to partially complete its mission. And unfortunately, you know, sewage treatment, water treatment, all those things that we depend on. Now we're taking airmen and soldiers out of the fight, which is a horrible, horrible thought when it just comes down to one and zeros. So are we done this time? We are done this time. <laughs> it's, um, it's not a trick. It's not a trick. All right. So we've uh, talked about some of the types of malware. We've talked about their role in the attack methodology. And, um, we need to be able to be able to, to think about these things because they're they are affecting our everyday lives and they affect our ability to carry out operations. So if we're talking about uh, spear phishing or phishing attacks, we need to be on the lookout for how we can trust the information that we are being provided on a day to day basis, so that we don't allow easy access in to for somebody to subvert our ability to do those things. Talk about vulnerabilities and how they're exploited. We just finished up talking about IoT, as we call it, or Internet of Things. And remember, think about those pros and cons. And remember, if you go back to this slide, the pros and cons were the same thing. Anything that is a feature is also a vulnerability. And we summarized some of those vulnerabilities inherent to ICS and why they still exist. Talking mm -hmm. about that bottom dollar and companies greedy. And then finally, we talked about how those cyber offensive cyber operations can achieve effects in support of operations so remember just as we need to protect ourselves from the enemy is the same things that we want to do to our enemy so all those nasty things we thought about what you could do to usafa is the same things that we think about what we could do to whatever our enemy state of the week is so thank you all for your attention and effort i hope you all enjoyed the video and uh we'll be looking forward to seeing you with the next one